Hello everybody, it's Peter Mortimer again, and today I'm going to give you a talk which I've called A Potted History of Glasgow. And this talk really came about because I get asked very often, how long have people lived in Glasgow? How did Glasgow come to be? So this is going to be a journey from the very, very earliest of times up to the modern day, and we're going to move at quite a pace. Um, so strap yourselves in, and here we go. Here we see our wonderful city, an aerial shot of uh, George Square, and you can just see how big the city is and how it's uh, growth and, and its construction. And it's uh, a, an amazing place, as we know, and was known as the second city of the empire. But how did we get here on that journey? Firstly, there's a lot of evidence of human habitation in the Glasgow area going back centuries and centuries, millennium, in fact. Uh, and here we see a photograph that was taken out at Mount Vernon on the east end of Glasgow. And this was some Glasgow antiquarians doing a dig at a, a place called Green Oak Hill at Mount Vernon. And in the centre, you can see the proud gentleman holding a Bronze Age skull, which had been lifted from a stone kist. And a kist was a type of coffin of that type. Now, there were other Bronze Age uh, sites and Iron Age sites around Glasgow. Queen's Park, for example, had uh, an Iron Age fort at the top, uh, a ring uh, fort, and there's others scattered around uh, the city. So people have lived in the Glasgow area, the Clyde uh, banks and around that area for many, very many, many years. The Romans were visitors to Glasgow. Uh, as you probably know, the Romans came and conquered Britain. They travelled right up through Britain and they got into the central belt and went beyond. But when they were in the central belt, uh, the Romans built Antonine Wall. Now, the Antonine Wall is perhaps not as well known as Hadrian's Wall down at the borders, but the Antonine Wall was across the waste of Scotland, the narrowest part of Scotland, and it ran from Bowling down on the Clyde near to Dumbarton all the way across to Caradhen, which is near Grangemouth, over on the Firth of Forth. And the Romans built the wall, and on it they placed a, a series of forts all the way along. And on the left-hand side there, you can see all the little yellow dots marking out Roman forts along the length of the Antonine Wall. Now, the Antonine Wall was not a wall in the traditional sense. It wasn't like Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall is a stone-built wall. Um, but the Antonine Wall was actually a ditch with turf ramparts and the marauding people from the north would have to go into the deep part of the ditch and then have to come out on the other side up a very steep embankment and this made it easy for the Romans to pick them off and if you go up to High Bonnie Bridge uh, there is a very good example of the Antonine Wall still extremely well preserved there. It was also believed that the Romans had a fort at what we now call York Hill, which would make a lot of sense because York Hill sits on a high point and it overlooks the River Clyde and the River Kelvin and would have been an ideal place to, to have a, a presence. Glasgow really started to become known to us um, when Christianity was brought into what we now call our city. And on the left-hand side, we see uh, St Mungo or St Kentigern. Now, Kentigern was a preacher and he came from Curus in Fife, and he travelled through to the west uh, to preach the word of Christ. And he established a small church uh, or preaching station uh, at the on the banks of a burn called the Molendiner. And the Molendiner burn uh, still flows today, but it's covered over. And the real heart of Glasgow is on the photograph on the right. This is a, a photograph of Wishart Street. Now, Wishart Street runs down behind the cathedral and behind the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. And it was here that St Kentigern, later known as Mungo, established his first church. And of course, the church was then superseded by Glasgow Cathedral, which was built in the 11th century. And at that time, Glasgow had two settlements. There was a settlement around the cathedral where the uh, the, the building of the cathedral was there, but there were uh, manses and accommodation for the, the, the bishops, and people uh, also acted as uh, almost as a service industry. They earned a living from uh, uh, providing for the cathedral. The other settlement in Glasgow was right down at the Clyde, uh, in the region of what we now know as the High Court, and a track of land, a track uh, road ran from the cathedral down 
to the, the river. And that was to become High Street and then Salt Market. So that's a very ancient track dating back to about the 1100s. One of the most significant dates in the development of Glasgow was in 1451, when Glasgow was given permission from the Pope to establish a university. And the University of Glasgow was established in 1451. Now, the university early lessons were held in the crypt of the cathedral. And after that, they transferred onto Rotten Row to an old, an old manse that was no longer in use and it became known as the Old Pedagogue. And pedagogue is a Latin word for a house of learning. Now here we see on the left the coat of arms of the University of Glasgow. And on the right hand side, we see the Glasgow University at the time it had moved from Rotten Row to the High Street. And it was sometimes referred to as the Old College. And hence the, re the reason on the east side of High Street, we have the lands known as College Lands and College Street on the opposite side. This building remained there uh, until about the 1870s, after which time it moved to a greenfield site, as we would call it today, and it moved out to the land on Gilmer Hill, where the University of Glasgow was completed. Now, when the university was getting built, it was the second largest construction project in the United Kingdom second only to the building of the Palace of Westminster. So it was a huge undertaking. Glasgow proceeded to grow and expand. Uh, it was, as we saw, a university town. Glasgow University is the second oldest in Scotland. And in the 1700s, the Glasgow merchants began to trade with the Americas. And these were the so-called tobacco lords. They would leave Scotland with their ships laden with cargo, textiles, rum, manufactured goods, and they would sail to the west coast of Africa. There, they would sell their cargo. They would then pick up another cargo, and that cargo was slaves, human slaves. They would then be transported across the Atlantic into the Caribbean and the Americas, where they would be sold off. And the return journey back to Glasgow, the, the ships would be laden with sugar, tobacco, uh, cotton, bringing it back over into Glasgow, which uh, it was then processed or sold on. An important time in Glasgow's history was involving a man called James Watt. James Watt was born in Greenock and he worked as an instrument maker at the University of Glasgow. One day while walking in Glasgow Green, he was trying to overcome the issue of the steam engine. The steam engines were in existence, but they were not very efficient. In other words, you had to put in a lot of coal to raise steam to get the power. They were quite inefficient. And during a, a stroll ac ac across Glasgow Green, James Watt came up with the notion of a separate condenser for the steam engine. And this was a world beating moment. This made the steam engine efficient. And it was also the beginning really of the industrial revolution because mass production could, could now be achieved As part of the Industrial Revolution, the movement of materials, cargo, raw materials around Scotland it became very important. And if ships and cargo sailed into the west coast of Scotland, to transport it to the east would either be across land or ships would have to go round the, the very top of Scotland, which was a, a, an arduous and sometimes dangerous journey. So in the late 18th century, it was a canal was built between uh, the Clyde and the River Forth. It ran uh, very similar in, in, in uh, its lineage to the Antonine Wall. It ran from Bowling down on the Clyde through to Grangemouth. And this was the motorway of the day. This was the M8 back uh, in the 18th century. And it, the terminus in Glasgow was up at Port Dundas and some many of the buildings still exist there. They were used as warehouses but now they've been converted into modern housing. The, the first major industry that really took grip in Glasgow in an industrial sense was cotton. The raw cotton was imported from the United States and it came into Glasgow and in the early 1820s, 1830s, Glasgow had a, in excess of 100 cotton mills. Uh, now, the cotton mills were able to take over from the handloom 
And you see the little cartoon on the left, and that's a hand loom, where all the work was done, as it, as it suggests, by hand, passing it through, the shuttles were passed through, uh, and the cloth was woven. Bring in power looms, which were powered by steam, thanks to James Watts and his condenser, and all of a sudden, you were producing on an industrial scale. And there we see a photograph on the right of uh, a cotton mill, and you can see how young the, the young girl is in, in the photograph. Uh, many of the cotton mills were uh, used, used young female labour uh, as, as their workforce. Here we see a couple of examples of existing cotton mills in Glasgow. The first one on the left is the oldest, the older of the two. And this, and this is on David Street, down off Gallagate. At, the first one is the of the two, and this is on the island. And you can see the weaving daylight roof. That was a little cotton mill that, that existed in my land. It had purposes. And on the right hand side, you see a really grand cotton mill. And this was built in 1849 for Alexanders, who were uh, cotton mill owners. And this remained as a cotton mill through till about 1908 when it was then converted to become the Great Eastern Hotel, which some of you may recognise. And we're looking down John Knox Street uh, onto the Duke Street at, at the Cotton Mill. And Glasgow boomed and became a real industrial powerhouse uh, through iron and steel. And one of the major industries in, in Glasgow at that time was shipbuilding. <clears throat> it was growing and it was becoming a very important part of the Glasgow economy. And here we see just one example. Uh, here we see the Fairfield shipping, shipyard down at Govan. And on the left, we see a boat getting launched. And on the right, we see the entrance, which is still there, uh, of the workers piling out at the end of the, the day, going, going back home. And shipyards employed large numbers of people directly and equally large numbers of people indirectly. And by that, that was all the, the companies that were making boilers, and doing carpentry, uh, all sorts of stuff. So the, the, the shipbuilding industry was a major driver in Glasgow becoming uh, such an important place. And at one time, 18% of all the world's ships were built on the Clyde. Now that's one in five ships almost that sailed the seas was built in the Clyde. And considering the number of uh, rivers all over the world that are, are making ships at that time, that was an incredible achievement, absolutely incredible. The iron and steel was also led to big foundries and forges, and none more so, I suppose, than the Beardmore Forge at Parkhead. And you see the photograph on the left there uh, of Beardmore's Forge in the foreground and the split of the road of Duke Street and Shettleson Road. Uh, Parkhead Forge was built in 1837, and the Beardmore family acquired it in 1861. And it, William Beardmore Jr. really grew the business to an enormous extent. During the First World War, the company employed 40,000 people. There were about five or 6,000 people at Parkhead, and the remainder were at places like Dalmuir, building ships, in Shinnan, building airships, and steel factories uh, in Lanarkshire. They made cars down in uh, Dumfries. It was a mar mar absolutely marvellous concern, uh, huge, and uh, they employed 40,000 people, as I say, and they were paying out £125,000 per week in wages. And on the right, you see one of the, 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 the engineering shops at Parkhead, and it's making armaments. That was a big, big part of Beardmore's uh, business. We had Sir William Arrow and Company down at the Domarnock Iron Works in Bridgeton, and they, of course, were the people who fabricated all the steel for the fourth rail bridge which was made in Bridgeton, transported to North and South Queen's Ferry and linked one side of the River Forth to the other and is a World Heritage Site. Another wonderful Glasgow company uh, was James Templeton and Templeton was a carpet manufacturer par excellence. Uh, there's wonderful premises still stand down at Glasgow Green, although no longer producing carpets, it's used as a business centre. But James Templeton were uh, world-class carpet makers. And on the right, you can see a photograph uh, from uh, Templeton's. And girls are literally lying on their stomach in the finishing department with a pair of scissors, just making sure everything was absolutely 
tip-top, first-class quality, and they certainly achieved that. They produced carpets that were sent to the White House, the Houses of Parliament, all the big ocean liners built on the Clyde, all had Templeton carpets. Glasgow was also a centre for railway manufacturing, locomotive manufacturing, and the home of that was the Springburn district of Glasgow, where um, around 28,000 um, locomotive engines were built in the course of the history of the Springburn area uh, between the North British and the Caledonian Railway. It was a, a massive concern, and sadly, we saw the last remnants of the railways closing in Glasgow just about nine months ago. With all the industry came all the people, and what had to happen is they had to be housed. And Glasgow, up until the middle of the 19th century, the housing was not great. <clears throat> A lot of the housing off the High Street and Salt Market and Brigate was little closes and venals, which were pretty disgusting places. So in 1866, the City Improvement Act was passed, and that allowed them to demolish all the closes and venals and replace them with new types of housing. And that new type of housing was the tenement. And on the right, we see an illustration of what a tenement looked like in through the close, up the stairs, and into the flats on the, on the various floors. It would normally be over three floors, some cases there were four story high tenements and uh, most tenements would have uh, two room and kitchens on the landing and a single end. A single end was approximately 11 foot 6 inches square and that was the size of a room that a family lived in totally, which is quite incredible. Uh, but tenements became a big, big part of the Glasgow landscape, the built environment, and many of them still exist uh, to the present time. With the large workforce that was now resident in Glasgow, uh, there was a need to transport them around. We had to find an efficient way of allowing people to leave their house in the morning and go to their work. And that was partly achieved by the subway system. Glasgow had its subway system and it was the third oldest in uh, the world, second only behind New York and Budapest. And it's a very simple system. It's a circular route and 15 stations on it, and it's still in use to this day, and a very important uh, link in the Glasgow uh, transport network, even, even in this uh, 2021. Other methods of transport, we had tram cars. Tram cars were incredibly efficient, and they covered the, the whole of the city, they zigzagged uh, across the city and beyond, right out as far as Airdrie and right out as far as Elderslie, uh, over in the Johnson area, but they were uh, the, the workhorse of getting people around Glasgow. And um, the last Glasgow tram uh, ran in 1962 in September, and it ceased then. And we look back now, and I think we would wish that we'd actually kept the tram system. Another way of getting people around was by the trolley bus. This was an electric bus which um, drew its power from cables overhead. And uh, they were sometimes referred to as the silent killer because there was no diesel engine noise coming from them. They were quite a quiet vehicle and many people would walk onto the road and maybe perhaps not hear it and suffer um, an injury. Glasgow also had to grow in municipal terms. Uh, with that came an infrastructure had to be put in to accommodate the people living in the city. And part of that was schools. In 1873, the Education Act was passed that required schools uh, education to be given to children between the ages of 5 and 13. So there was a huge programme of school building uh, from about 1873 onwards in the city. And there's many uh, of the schools, secondary, primary, scattered all over the, all over the city, uh, were, were built. Many of them uh, were demolished, but a lot of them still remain. And the, the older sandstone style buildings are of that vintage. Other amenities had to be put in, and a quite an important amenity that Glasgow provided for its population was wash houses. And these were important insofar as they provided unlimited hot water and, and drying racks for the women of Glasgow to take the washing and go and uh, every week do the laundry. Because in the tenements, um, they didn't have washing machines. Some back courts had wash houses. Uh, but nothing compared to the municipal wash houses that were scattered throughout the city. On the left-hand side, we see the Green Dyke uh, baths down in Glasgow Green, and this was the first of the public wash houses uh, opened by the, the corporation uh, at that time. And on the right, you can see an internal shot of a wash house 
with the boilers and everything there that a woman would need to maintain the hygiene in her own home and then do the laundry. Another part of the municipal input into Glasgow society was the provision of libraries. And Glasgow's had a real love affair with libraries over the years. Uh, many district libraries were built. These were really well used. Many of the original buildings still exist. The one on the left, for example, is Parkhead Library, and that's still uh, with us today. This was one of the so-called Carnegie Libraries. Andrew Carnegie, who owned US Steel, uh, was a from Dunfermline, and he travelled to America, and he made his fortune. And he was a very philanthropic man. He gave a lot of money away, and he gave uh, away vast sums of money worldwide for the building of uh, of the above libraries. Now, Glasgow got some of that money, got about £100,000, and was able to open eight libraries, which are known as the so-called Carnegie Libraries. And the one on the left, is, as I say, is Parkhead, and this is such a library. On the right, we have the wonderful and the beautiful Mitchell Library. And the Mitchell Library is the largest reference library in Europe. Uh, the building was opened in 1911, and it is truly magnificent, and it is the jewel in the Glasgow Library crown. With all the people coming and working and being educated and having uh, somewhere to live in a tenement, they also had to be entertained. And Glasgow has, and still is, a great entertainment centre. Uh, Glasgow has a great theatre tradition. There are many, many theatres in Glasgow over the years. We still have a few, but uh, we certainly had a lot more back in the day. And we also embrace anything that's American. Glasgow loves a piece of that. And one of the American things was cinema. And Glasgow opened many, many cinemas. It became known as Cinema City. And at one time, there were around 120 cinemas in, in the city of Glasgow. You had the big cinemas in the city centre. And we see one on the left of the Odeon from the 1930s. Uh, and you had many, many district cinemas. Uh, these sometimes were small, sometimes were flea pits. Uh, but Glasgow loved cinema and uh, was a great patron of the film industry. On the right, we see the Empire Theatre, which stood on Sucky Hall Street. Um, and this was one, again, of many theatres in Glasgow. And this was the uh, one of the prime theatres in the city. It attracted names like um, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, all the big American um, uh, entertainers came, as did all the British entertainers. And of course, there's a famous story where the, the late Des O'Connor went onto the stage and the Glasgow audiences were known as being particularly difficult to please. And Les, uh, Des O'Connor was going down quite badly, wasn't wasn't cutting it with the crowd. And in order to get off the stage, he, he, he fainted, or he hadn't really fainted, but he kidded on, he fainted just to get taken off stage. Something I'm told that Morecambe and Wise never let him forget. After the Second World War, Glasgow went through a period of change. Um, there was lots happening. The, the population in Glasgow at that time was around a million people. And a lot of the tenements that had been built in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s were falling into disrepair. And immediately after the war, there was a need for more housing. So Glasgow constructed four principal uh, periphery schemes, one in the northwest, northeast, south, East and Southwest, and they were Trunk Chapel, Easter House, Castle Milk, and Pollock. And people were then decanted from the old part of Glasgow out to these peripheral housing schemes. And the houses were terrific. They had two rooms, kitchen, bathroom, um, very, very nice houses. But what they didn't have was amenities in the district, and this became a real thorny issue. Glasgow went through quite a dull and quite a dark period in the 1960s with the demolition of the tenements that I mentioned. And it really was quite a bleak place. And then something happened in the early 70s, and that was uh, women over in Govan started to complain about their houses and said, we want better houses. So a huge programme started in the city, particularly in Govan and up Mary Hill, of refurbishing tenements. Uh, and all of a sudden, Glasgow started to clean the tenements, and it was beginning to look an altogether better place, driven, as I say, mainly by the women of the community, which was great. 
And then Glasgow got an accolade in 1988. It was to be the location for the Garden Festival. Uh, and I think a few people were cynical at the time about Glasgow being able to accommodate this. Anyway, they did. And it was over on the south side in the area of the former Prince's Dock. And the Garden Festival was built. And it was an enormous success. Absolutely huge. People visited and the, the numbers were great. It ran from the spring through to late summer and it was fantastic. Two years later, Glasgow got the European City of Culture Award. And that was a real wow factor for the city because all of a sudden people would come to the city to see the Garden Festival. It raised awareness. And then talk began to go round about Glasgow has some amazing architecture and people began to look up and the architecture of the city is phenomenal. We have some tremendous architects have, have applied the trade in, in Glasgow and we've, we've got a great built, built heritage legacy. And uh, as I say, to get the European uh, City of Culture Award was fantastic. Uh, times for Glasgow. For 2014, the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth Glasgow a huge success in 2014, Commonwealth Games, Commonwealth Games Light. And I think that was also a huge boost with the show Glasgow. And, and we've gone on a journey. Very quick journey through Glasgow's history, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much.